Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Khaldun Azhari, a member of this club, and uh, I have the pleasure to moderate this event. And today is one of uh, our series, Meet the Press. It's an FCCJ monthly evening program uh, to uh, tell the people about the activities of our uh, journalists who are members in this club, and everyone has a lot of things to tell other than uh, compiling stories. Our guest speaker today, uh, Mr. Kirk Spitzer, is a Tokyo correspondent for USA Today. It's one of the most prominent publications in the United States, and it has very international uh, audience also. He is responsible for covering uh, defense, politics, business, and social issues in Japan. It's basically everything. Also, it's in the uh, Asia-Pacific region. And although uh, he has spent more than a quarter century covering defense and foreign affairs, uh, including frontline coverage of wars and armed conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Balkans, Maybe in the future you have some other place to go also, because wars seems not to end in this world. Mm -hmm. uh, East Africa also and elsewhere, he has uh, worked in print, television, and online. Basically now every journalist has to do all of these together. And Kirk also, uh, uh, he uh, now is still active, and uh, just the background, he graduated from the University of Hawaii with a degree of, in journalism and was a Jefferson Fellow at the East-West Center in Hawaii. And uh, uh, at the Herbert Devin, Devin Pot Fellow at the University of Missouri. Sorry of my spelling, but mm -hmm. it's written. And uh, he started uh, his career as a business and government reporter for newspapers in uh, Tahalisi, Florida, and uh, Fort, Fort Worth, Texas, then worked as a Pentagon uh, correspondent for uh, Janet News Service and USA Today in Washington, D.C. from 1990 to 2002. And he worked for CBS News as a reporter and producer based in Paris until moving to Japan in 2007. And in Tokyo, he worked uh, for Bloomberg Television and as a freelance writer for Time Magazine before returning to uh, USA Today last year. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest speaker today. Thank you. No, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here tonight. Uh, everyone can hear me? Can hear me okay? Great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I always enjoy talking about uh, news coverage, but particularly I like talking about um, covering wars and armed conflicts. And that's because it's one of the few things that I think I know something about. I've been very fortunate in my career. I've been able, able to spend uh, quite a bit of time uh, around uh, conflicts around the world, and starting with, uh, I guess, the first Gulf War in 1990, then in Somalia, Bosnia, Haiti, um, Kosovo then uh, Iraq and Afghanistan more recently. So I have uh, a fair amount of experience. And for the most part, it's been a great experience. Um, you know, wars and armed, armed conflicts are among the most important and challenging assignments that any, any reporter can have. You're working in remote, in remote locations. You're working in very chaotic conditions. You're covering life and death, oftentimes very sudden and violent life and death. You're seeing history being made very often. And you're seeing people in wartime and in hostile environments and armed conflicts, you're seeing people at their very best and their very worst, often the same people at the same time. So professionally, it's a very rewarding experience. But as you all know, you know, can imagine, it's also quite a dangerous, it can be very, very dangerous. And conflicts are moving faster than ever before. Weaponry is more lethal than it's ever been before. And, tar and journalists are being targeted like they've never been targeted before, both on the battlefield and off. According to a report that was released just last month by the International Federation of Journalists, just under 2,300 journalists have been killed in covering wars, armed conflicts, and other dangerous assignments since 1992. That works out to just, sh sh just shy of two per week for the last 25 years. And that doesn't, even, that doesn't even count the number of journalists and others who have who've who've lost arms and legs or have suffered 
other grievous injuries or have had a lot of uh, suffered um, you know, emotional or, or psychological trauma. With all, with, that, all, all, what all this means is that the days of being able to just show up and start covering a war are long gone, if they ever really were around. Right now, today, war coverage requires a couple of things. It requires very specialized training and equipment. It requires very careful planning and preparation. And it requires a very different mindset from normal day-to-day -day news coverage. OK, yeah, but so what? You know, there's no war out here right now. You know, Japan hasn't fought a war in 70 years. The United States hasn't fought a war in Asia since they left Vietnam in 1975. So there's nothing to worry about, right? We're not going to get in a war out here. Why, why even bother with this stuff? Well, we all know, you know, wars come out of nowhere. No one ever heard of ISIS just five years ago, and now it's dominating the Middle East. And out here, we've got, you know, some potential problems as well. You've probably heard of North Korea. You know, building they're building nuclear weapons and long-range missiles. And that's not good for anybody. China has boosted its defense spending by double digits each of the last, you know, for 10 years. And there's no end in sight in that. They're building, China is building a modern Navy, advanced fighter planes, ballistic missiles that can target uh, aircraft carriers, American aircraft carriers far out to sea. China is claiming islands in the East China Sea that Japan has controlled for more than 100 years. They're building artificial islands all across the South China Sea, where, where five other countries are currently um, claiming territory. What about the Americans? Well, the Americans are sending more troops and their newest and, and most powerful ships and airplanes um, to this region, and they're sending more troops as well. It's part of the, American, part of the pivot or the rebalance that we've, we've been hearing about over the last few years. Twice in the last six months, the Americans have sent warships into, into to waters, territorial waters claimed by China in the South China Sea. In Japan, we all know that, that Prime Minister Abe has succeeded in passing legislation last year that, that eases long-standing constitutional restraints on the, use, on the use of trans military. Japan has boosted its, its defense spending at least in each of the last three years. And um, Prime Minister Abe is proposing a budget for next year that's at or near the an all-time high. The, the, the Japan Self-Defense Forces, well, they're building new bases in, this, in, this, in the Nansei Shoto in the so Southwest Islands, and they're moving forces from the north down to the south. And the ground self-defense forces in particular, they're building a new, and they're creating a new amphibious warfare unit something they've never had before. And it's modeled on the United States Marine Corps. It's designed to defend or retake remote islands, like, for example, the Senkakus. Right now, even as we speak, there's about 250 or 300 uh, GATI um, members of this new unit that are, tra that are training with the American Marines in, in, in Southern California right now. OK. So, but even with all that, I, I really don't think we're going to have a full-on full war out here anytime soon. You know, but, you know. I mean, I'm usually, I'm often wrong on these kind of things. And um, I don't think that you can rule out uh, an armed conflict of some sort uh, out here sometime in the near future. Hopefully not, but I, I don't think it's completely out of the question. Okay, so how would you go about covering it? How do you go, how does some, you go covering a war? Well, the first thing you do nowadays, the first thing you really have to do is anyone who's going to go out into a conflict zone has to take what we call hostile environment training. And these are usually two to four day courses that are offered by private security contractors in the United States, Britain, and a few other places. Um, they're usually run by former uh, special operations forces, soldiers in, in Britain. That means the British SAS, the United States means American Green Berets or Navy SEALs. And these, these programs are designed to teach reporters how to live, to work, and to travel safely, safely or at least relatively safely. Um, or at least to reduce the risks you know, when you're moving, when you're going to or moving around uh, war zones or conflict zones or any kind of hostile environment. And these kind of courses didn't even exist 25 years ago, but now they're required by, mo by many of the uh, biggest news organizations around the world. Um, and they should be, in my view, they should be standard for anybody, anyone who's going to go anywhere near a hostile environment. Okay, so what are the basics? What are the basics? What do you got here? 
Okay. So hostile environment training. And operating in, in, in a hostile environment, in war, in armed conflict, there's, there's, sa there's a safety equipment that should be absolutely mandatory. Everybody should be wearing a helmet and a flak jacket, ballistic glasses, ear protection. Ballistic glasses are basically like goggles, like goggles that, mean, that are going to stop. They won't stop a bullet, but shrapnel or anything, uh, anything small and sharp, it, they're gonna, they'll stop that and they'll protect your, they'll protect your eyes. Hearing protection is really, really critical. I know this. I'm deaf in one ear from an explosion, so um, you know, I'm good on the other one. Um, so that's important. And a first aid kit, I mean, that's one thing that we, everybody forgets about. You gotta have one. You absolutely have to. You have to know how to use one, okay? Okay, so also you gotta learn that in a hostile, any kind of cover in any war, hostile environment, you need to have all your documentation with you. You gotta have a passport with you. You have to have a press ID preferably with your photo on it. You need to have a letter from an employee that you can show somebody. If you're, if you're a freelancer, for example, you have to have some sort of documentation that you can show somebody so that if you're stopped at a checkpoint, somebody wants to know who you are, you can prove that I'm not a spy, I've, here, you know, I've got some sort of authority here. Governments are also, uh, governments are also very reluctant to allow journalists in and moving around, so you need to have, to be able to prove who you are. So you gotta have to carry that all the time. You need some sort of medical documentation. Something shows your blood type, your medical history, if you're, if you're allergic to any kind of medicine. You have to be carrying that because you never know. Medical insurance, you need to have that. How many people, how, how much um, uh, do you think medical insurance, how much do you think you should carry if you're gonna go to a war zone? Anybody have any idea? Anybody? Give me, somebody give me a guess, how much? A million. A million dollars, yeah, that's about the minimum. You should, it'll cost you a couple thousand dollars uh, for a couple of months to have a million dollars. And it's also in, 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 it, in, in your documentation, you need to have it specifically spelled out that, you, that this is gonna cover um, air, uh, air evacuation. You know, um, usually private, you know, small Learjets that are tricked out as, as, as hospital units. In, in wars, the, the American military, when they're operating in Iraq or Afghanistan, the first thing they do is they set up very, very sophisticated field hospitals wherever they go. But the first thing they do is when somebody comes into those field hospitals, they patch them up as, mess, as, as well as they can and they get them on a flight back home immediately, within 24 hours if they can do it. And if you're a journalist, you need to be able to get that same kind of care if you can. And then also um, next of kin, contact information. That's what, you know, just in case the worst happens, um, you need to be able to, to, to get in touch with folks back home. Okay, so some, some of the safety do's and don'ts. Uh, first aid. Excuse me. First aid, this is probably the most important thing that you're gonna learn in the hostile environment training, or even if you don't have hostile environment, this is what you need to know. You first, first aid tra and, and trauma care. If, if you're out in the field, if, if Calton and I are traveling somewhere and I get shot, what Calton does in the next five minutes determines whether I'm gonna live or die. So Calton, I've, Calton, I've been shot. What's the first thing you do? I call the ambulance. Well, not if you're out in the middle of any, no, nowhere. I think, you know, basically I have to take care of the immediate. Right, right. exactly so. Right, and what you learn is it's, it's you learn ABC, airways, breathing, circulation. It means the first thing you look for is you clear the, clear the person's airway. Make, make sure that they can breathe. Make sure that their mouth is clear and their throat's clear. If they're bleeding from their mouth, you turn them over so the blood flows out of their mouth and not into their lungs. The next thing you do is you look for breathing. You make sure that their heart, their heart is moving if you, and, and that they're getting air into their lungs. If someone is shot in the chest and they have what we call a, a sucking chest wound, it means they're not gonna get the oxygen they need, so you need to cover up that wound. If their heart just stopped beating, you need to get that going. So you need breathing, so it's airways and breathing, and then circulation, which is blood. What that means is you, if, you have to check if, see if, if a person is bleeding and stop the bleeding. Anybody know how you do that? Anybody know, how do you check? I mean, if, how do you check, what's the procedures for figuring out how somebody's, if somebody's injured? I mean, if somebody has a shot in the shoulder and they're ble bleeding there, it's obvious you, you stop that. But they might be shot somewhere else. You know, they might have two or three injuries and you might not see them. So what you need to do, what you're, what you're trained to do and what, they, what they, they, they teach you to do and they force you to practice, you start with the person's head and you feel their, all the way down their entire body. You start with the head, down both arms, down chest, down their back, down their torso. You go, you go under their shirt, whether it's, you know, you can't be modest. If male or female, you go under their clothes and you feel every bit of their body to see where, to see if there's any injuries. And that's, and that's basically how it's done. It's kind of, 
It's a little gruesome, um, but it's something that you have to do. And not only do you need to do it yourself, you need to make sure that whoever you're traveling with has that same kind of training. If they don't, you might not want to go traveling with that person. Then the other things you learn is that like the hiring local staff, uh, vehicle inspection. Vehicle inspections, believe it or not, is really, really important. A lot of times when you're traveling around conflict zones, you're having to rent um, local vehicles or you're renting a driver usually in a vehicle. And usually it's very catch as catch can. The, the vehicles are oftentimes very sketchy. Friends and I were in, 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 uh, in Haiti and we piled into one vehicle once and we didn't even go 10 meters and a wheel fell off. I mean, it fell off. And a couple of days later, we hopped into another vehicle. We ranged for a good driver, a good car, good driver. It was like a Mercedes, uh, four by four. A bunch of, we were supposed to pick us up at four in the morning, so we, we were supposed to go to check the seaport and the airport. And it was, there was rioting and there was a coup going on. It was very, very dangerous. And this was in Haiti, Port au Prince, Haiti. So we get in the vehicle and we start driving across that. We didn't even go two kilometers, and the, we're driving along through one of the worst possible slums that you've ever seen in your life, and the vehicle just goes chung, 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 boom, and it stopped. And our driver turns and looks at us, he goes, no gas. <laughs> and how can you, you know, and she, no gas, no gas. We'd hired him for the whole day. He was supposed to take us all around. And no, you'd, who picks you up with a vehicle with no gas in it? Well, in fact, everybody in the third world does that. You know, until you learn, you know, that because they don't really have much, you, you know, much money to go out and fill up the whole tank. Or you don't have a gas station on every street. So, in hostile environment training, they teach you, check that vehicle every lights, engine, batteries, gas, tires, spare tire. Make sure the spare tire is, 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 is inflated. Make sure you have a jack. Take the jack out and change the tire so that you make sure you know everything works. These are the kind of basics that you need you know, you wouldn't think of these things until, you know, until it's too late. And this is what hostile environment training is all about, and this is what experience is about. Then dealing with checkpoints, mob violence. Mobs have always scared me the most. Uh, human hazards. These are all things that you need to learn. So travel basics. Ba again, traveling in and into and out of and around a hostile environment zone. Travel is really moving from place to place is one of the most dangerous and difficult things. Rule number one, you never travel alone, never. Even if you're in a two-person crew, like a camera crew, you know, reporter and a cameraman, or reporter and photographer, basically, if you're traveling somewhere together, you count as one. So you want to have somebody else with you all the time. And, so, and you always let the most cautious person set the pace. If you've got three or four people with you, you've got four people with you, and three of you think it's okay to go from point A to point B, and that fourth person says, no, nah, you're like, I, you know, I just, I don't, it's just too sketchy, we shouldn't go. You don't go. I mean, that's the basic rule of thumb. And you, know, you, you wait a day, or you, know, you make another arrangement, or you, know, you get rid of that fourth person, you find somebody else <laughs> more compliant the next day. But in any case, you know, you know, safety, safety, safety in these things. Um, you need a point of contact if you're going to go from this town to that town. You need a point of contact there. You need somebody who's, who can tell you if it's safe or not, or a place, to, a least location, a guest house, or you're going to go to a government office or something. But you need to know what's going on in that, at that destination. It can't be just like, okay, let's just get in a vehicle and go. You need to know what's going on there. And you need a communication plan. You have to have you're somebody in your office, usually somebody in your office back home in Tokyo or wherever it is, knows that you're going from, from point A to point B, you know, knows that you're planning to leave at such and such time and you should arrive at such and such time or that you're supposed to, to, to check in. Um, we were in, a, um, uh, in Afghanistan in the early part of the bombing campaign there and there were some problems with the Taliban was kind of on the loose. So a bunch of us reporters in a place called Talikan had to basically run for the border. And the BBC put together a, a large convoy. The BBC has a lot of armed guards, these, these uh, private military contractors, former SAS guys. And they had formed a big convoy. Um, and me and a partner had, had, uh, had rented a car and a driver as part of that convoy. And we got separated. But we had, uh, we had a, a satellite phone with us. We had a phone number to, to call at BBC headquarters back in, in, in London who knew who everybody was and where we were going. We were able to contact them, and we were able to stay in touch, and we were, we were able to, to, to rendezvous with them. No problem. But it's because we had a communication plan. 
Okay. All right. Um, so, let's see, so, okay. So that's, that's the basics. So war is, so okay. So the war started, and we're all trained. What's next? What's next? Next. Well, actually, what's next? He's going to go shopping. <laughs> you're going to go shopping because there's still a lot of stuff that you need. You know, now whether you're going to whether you're going to uh, focus on covering the military side of things or the civilian side of things, you really have to plan on living rough in a, in a war zone. I mean, sometimes you can live in a nice city. You can stay there's you know cities that have nice hotels. And you know you might be staying there, and things might be just fine, um, but you're probably going to have to go out back and forth a lot. You know, a lot. Um, you're going to be staying with the military a couple days, a couple weeks, or you're going to be going to some some place that has nothing. Some of us during the Kosovo War were stayed up on a um, on the the border with Albania. It was in the middle of the winter, freezing, freezing, freezing cold, and we stayed in the government a summer guest home, which had no heat. They opened it up for us. But basically, it was like zero degrees centigrade outside, and you walk inside, and it's zero degrees centigrade. So you're living in that kind of condition. No running water, no electricity, you know, no electricity nothing. So you need to, to be ready um, for, the, for living, living kind of rough. Now, what I've got here, just for fun, is I brought along a fairly generic packing list that I use. And this is what, I use this for, this is sort of my cold weather uh, packing, packing list. Um, but it's sort of, you, you'll, get the, you'll get the idea. Um, again, helmet, first thing, helmet, flak jacket, ballistic glasses, earplugs, all that, that stuff. You got to have that. I, I always take knee pads with me because I, um, you know, I usually use a camera. And so if you need to, you know, you know if you're around, especially around troops or something, they're always, you're always taking a knee, you're going to bang up your knee, especially if you're getting to be like kind of aged like me. You know, you want to be, you know, kind of take it easy on your body if you can. Um, then basics, you know, like a fleece jacket, Gore-Tex um, shell, some, you know, something that's warm. You've got layers, hiking boots. Boots are probably the most important thing. You know, if you're gonna, if you're, you guys, anybody here wants to cover a war, spend a lot of time getting the right pair of boots. It really makes a big difference. Gloves and liners, C uh, khaki or cat and uh, khaki or cotton field pants and field shirts. Any reason? Anybody know why I'm saying cotton or khaki instead of? Um, this really nice, you know, synthetic stuff that you can get at, at hiking shops. You know, that's that's breathable and you know, and and water, you know, and, and you know, easy to wash and all that stuff. Why not that? Why 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 cotton? You know? For burns, for burns. Synthetics synthetics melt really fast. And there's always a possibility that you're going if there's an if you're in a an explosion. There's an explosion. There's a flashover, and you can survive a flashover. Um, but if, if you're wearing a synthetic, it's very quickly gonna, gonna melt right to your skin and it's gonna be horrific burns. You're gonna be years and years of recovery from that. It, can, it ruins the tendons underneath and it's ugly and the skin cracks and you just, it's really, really horrible. Um, and, uh, you know, but if, if it's cotton and you just a flashover, you know, the cotton will, you know, it'll smoke a bit, uh, but it'll protect you. So it's really important to know that. You know, and then you always have a hat or wool cap if it's cold, bandana, flip-flops for, you know, if you're in showers. The worst thing in the world is to get that shower. You know, you haven't had a shower in like two weeks. Oh, God, thank God I got a shower. Great, great, great. And you take a shower. And then, you know, you got to put your feet back into like a muddy boots or something. You know, showers. Okay. Okay. Uh, after a sleeping bag, of course, that's obvious. Uh, an insulated sleeping mat. Believe it or not, this is really important. You're going to be living, in, living hard and in miserable conditions, but you're also working. You're also gonna be working 16 or 18 hours a day. It's really, really tough. So you need to get some rest. You need sleep. And sleeping on a, even in a nice sleeping bag, if you're sleeping on a hard concrete floor, it's miserable. Or outside, you know, you know if there's, even, on the, even in the desert, you know, if there's, you're sleeping on the sand, you think, oh, okay, that's nice. You know, it's desert sand, no. There's rocks and there's sticks and there's bugs and, you know, so, so the, there are these really nice, um, uh, insulated, you know, uh, what uh, self-inflating mats that you just roll out. And boop, they're about like that thick, so it, they're really nice. Boom, just get on there. You're very comfortable. And in the morning, you just ro roll it back up and you go. Um, camelback is, you know, you need water. Uh, so camelback, you know, you've seen all the, oh, seen the athletes wear them. You know, they're, you wear know, like a looks like a backpack with a with a, a tube full of water. It's fine. Headlamp and flashlights, you need that. 
tubes, you know, folding knives, GPS, all that's obvious. Duct tape, you can use duct tape for everything. I personally, I think with enough duct tape, we could achieve world peace, but, but maybe not. But in any case, you always have duct tape. You can use it for anything, for bandages. You know, if you run out of bandages, you get hurt, you wrap cloth around you and duct tape it, and you're good to go. Cigarette lighter, you always need that. Personal items, um, just obvious, you know, liquid soap. Baby wipes, you know, you, you can't have enough baby wipes. And uh, Cash, always need cash. Lots and lots of cash, you carry it with you at all times. Usually in a, um, you, know, in a uh, uh, you know, a belt under your clothes. If you get stopped, somebody wants to steal it, you lose it, but you know, you, you gotta have it. Um, and then some sort of waterproof case um, for all your documentation. We've talked about that, notebooks and so forth. Uh, snack food, high calorie snack food. You're gonna miss, you're gonna miss meals out, out there. Uh, and, and again, if you're working 18 hours a day and you're not getting much sleep and you're hungry on top of it, you're just not gonna be effective. So you have to take that, you know, always have extra like power bars and things on you. Not only for yourself, but for your people around, around you. Somebody is always out of food, somebody hasn't eaten, so it's nice to have something to share. You make friends, and they owe you a you know they they owe you a favor. And electronics, you know, communication. Right now, you know, cell phones are so great. You know, the coverage of mobile phones is really great, but there's a lot of places it doesn't work. Um, so BGAN, you know, BGAN is basically a, a satellite data and phone you know um, voice transmission. About this about this size, about this weight. Um, there's all kind, and every year there's new technology comes along. Um, this new new system of DiGero, um, basically a DiGero system, is like um, it's a, it's a unit a little smaller than this, and it's like having five or six uh, cell phones all packed together, and that's the kind of bandwidth you get. So you're able to to send uh, audio and video fairly high speed without having to connect to a satellite, which is a big deal. I mean, satellites, even with the BGAN. Connecting to a satellite can be kind of iffy, but so you, so you get all, all this nice um, electronics. You know, you always need power cords and power surge, you know, um, uh, surge protectors, all that, you know, adapters, all that stuff. Batteries, lots and lots of batteries. Um, you basically, rule of thumb is three for one. You figure out how many batteries do I think I need? You know, you know if I need, you know, I think I'm gonna need six for this trip, you take 18, because you never wanna run out. And also because somebody's going to forget. So you're going to need you know, somebody, one of your partners or somebody's going to forget. You're going to need some for, for other people. So that's what you want. Um, that's your basic packing list. And you're going to want to keep it all in a packing case about this big. You can see right here, um, okay, this is a fairly standard case that I take. It's called a Pelican case. And um, all of your gear should fit into one of these things here. And most recently in Iraq, Afghanistan, I would take two, one for my camera gear and transmission gear, um, and then one for all this other stuff that we've gone through. Um, I think now, it's been a few years since I've done this, but I think now I could probably get it down even smaller because everything has shrunk down so much. Um, but basically, you want to keep everything nice and compact like that. Uh, okay, so, all right, so now you, so we've, so we've gotten our training. And uh, we've gone shopping and gotten all our gear. And war is on. Now you've got to figure out where you, what you're going to do. You gotta, are you going to cover the civilian side of things or are you going to cover the military side? You're probably going to end up covering a little of each. But you're going to probably, you know, it's, it's going to be predominantly one or the other. So how do you do that? Um, now I won't, I won't spend too much time talking about the civilian side of things. Um, because I know a little bit more about the military, and, and this is getting, I've been talking a lot anyway. Um, but civilians, when you arrive in a, in, a, in a war zone or a hostile environment or something like that, you, you're looking for what we call gateway organizations, people who know what's going on, and it's a place to start. So anywhere there's a war on or a hostile environment or something bad going on, UNHCR, the UN High Commission for Re Refugees, is, is usually there. UN is usually the first on the scene, and they've got people there. And that's where you go, and you, you ask them, what's going on? You know, where are things? Where are the refugee camps? Where are the troubles? Where do we go? Where, what places do you avoid? What places do we need to go? Uh, same thing with Red Cross. Um, then the, there's a lot of civilian agencies, uh, NGOs, uh, the World Food Program, for example, Save the Children. There's lots and lots of the, these, these organizations. And these are often where you get your ideas for where you're going to 
you know, what you're going to do. Everybody heads first for the refugee camps to talk about the women, you know, women, children suffering, and that's always a really key, important story, at least to begin with. And so, this is kind of where, this is how you do that. You, that's where you start. Then the military. Um, okay, military. Uh, you, you have some, you know, there's no, again, there's no war out here right now, but let's just say there is a war out here, and you want to, you're interested in covering the military. Where would you start first? Anybody have any idea where you would go first? Actually, you'd probably start in Hawaii, believe it or not. Anybody know why? Hawaii. Hawaii is where the U.S. Pacific Command is located. And the way the American military works is that basically they have regions that they basically chop up regions of the world and say, okay, they appoint a commander and say, okay, any American forces that have to do any fighting in this area, they belong to you and you're in charge. And in the Asia Pacific region, that's the U.S. Pacific Command. Basically goes from west of the California, the west coast of California, basically to the point of, of India. Um, and then from the Arctic down to the Antarctic. From the term they call it is, is Hollywood to Bollywood and the Arctic to the Antarctic. And everything in there falls under the command of U.S. Um, Pacific Command in Hawaii. Anybody know who the commander of the U.S. Pacific Command in Hawaii is? Anybody? Anybody? A guy named Harry Harris, and he's actually uh, a Japanese-American. He was actually born, his, his mom is Japanese. He was born in Sasebo, and, uh, but he's actually raised in Tennessee. But, you know, he's a uh, you know, Japanese-American guy. He's highest-ranking Japanese-American uh, military officer ever. So Harry's the guy. Harry's the guy you call. He's, he'll be in charge. Other major organizations, if there was a war in, in this region, Harry would be the guy who would be calling the overall shots. But then there are other organizations that are also very, very going to be have uh, uh, a, a very big role in the war. And that U.S. 7th Fleet, if the Navy is involved in fighting anywhere in the South China Sea or anywhere out here, Western Pacific, it's going to be the U.S. 7th Fleet based at Yokosuka. So if you're interested in covering the Navy, you call Harry in, Pacific, in Hawaii first, then the 7th Fleet in, in Yokosuka. Oh, actually, I talked about Hawaii. Well, the interesting thing about Hawaii is I've always said my, in my whole life, I said just once in my life, I want to cover a war in a place where you can order a beer. Yeah. And Hawaii is really what I'm thinking about, because since the Pacific Command is headquartered there and the decision making is there, that's a good place to be, because all the information is going to come back. If it's a big war, all the information is going to come back there, and they're going to hold daily briefings. So i really going to be really, really tempted. If a war breaks out, I'm to call my boss and say, hey, you know, I really need to go to Hawaii. Okay. You, know, you, you can imagine what the chances of him, him or her saying yes to that, right? And you say, no, Kirk, you're not going to Hawaii. <sighs> I can dream. Okay, so 7th Fleet takes care of the, the Navy. Uh, the 5th Air Force, the, anything, any kind of air fighting is going to be the 5th Air Force, which is based at Yokosuka. Don't ask me why they call it the 5th Air Force. It's just, they just do, but it's like they're the, they're the Air Force guys are in charge. Um, the Marines... Overall, the U.S. military forces in Japan in this area are really, really complicated. And the Marines especially. You know, you always read stories about Okinawa and the troops on Okinawa. It's, it's con they're confusing, right? It's really confusing about who's down there, bases, and, you know, Futenma. Well, even professionals are confused. Even the Marines are confused about what they have down there. There's so many different organizations. But essentially, there's two main, if there was going to be a war, there's two main uh, Marine Corps units that you'd want to be dealing with or that you're going to probably hear about. And that's the first is the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force. And basically that's the headquarters for every all the Marines. Any Marine basically comes that's going to do any fighting in this area is going to come under command of the 3rd the Marine Expeditionary Force. They don't have a whole lot of guys out here right now, but everybody from, you know, Marines from California, from the states, they would come out here and they would fall under these guys. So that's, so if you wanted to go cover the Marines, and you wanted to go and be embedded with the Marines, as we call it. They're the guys that you would start off with. There's also another unit called the 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit. That's a smaller unit based on Okinawa also. It's like a little miniature invasion force. They've got ground, ground troops, uh, artillery, support units. They've got helicopters, fighter planes. And they're the guys that get on these amphibious war, these, these ships that look like small aircraft carriers. And they go out for two or three months at a time just just 
just you know, sailing around the Asia Pacific region, kind of waiting for trouble to happen. Right? And if there's, so if there's a war, if, if any kind of armed conflict suddenly breaks out here, these are the guys are going to be there first. So if you, so you want to cover this and you see a war coming and you think the Marines are going to be involved, these are the guys you want to call first and say, hey, oh, you know, I want to, you know, do you have room to take me? Do you, you know, where are you guys going to go? When are you going to be there? So forth and so on. Um, then if there's anything in, in uh, Korea, it's going to be U.S. Forces Korea. Uh, the Japan, the JSDF, that's really interesting. Um, that would be a really interesting organization to cover if there's a, really, if there's a fight. Um, if there's anything that starts over the Senkaku Islands, they're going to be fighting first, and the Americans will come in later on if necessary. Um, covering them, those guys are going to be really hard, though. You know, the JSDF, I found to be a very professional organization, but they just haven't fought a real war in 70 years, which is a great thing, and hopefully they won't have to for another 70. But if they do, covering them, particularly covering them in the field, is going to be pretty difficult. Um, but the place to go is you start is with the, uh, the, the joint staff. They're basic. They're the guys that are going to control the forces, um, basic at Ichigaya. Um, so, so that gives you a quick uh, a quick overlook at um, ah, at what's going on with how the forces are organized. Um, okay. So we know. It's okay. So once the war starts, then you have to decide where where you're going to be. And let me get this back here. Um, but you know, I think I'm going to wrap this up here right now. I've been doing a lot of talking, so let's let's have some questions and maybe some conversation if you'd like. But let me let me make one one more point before before I turn it over to questions, and that is, no matter what kind of you know, we've talked about the wars being a very different kind of thing and a very difficult thing and dangerous and so forth. You need special you need special training equipment. You need special preparation and planning. You need a different mindset. All that's different from anything else. But the basics of journalism do not change. No matter whether you're covering business or sports or politics or shooting war, the basics are still the same. You're still looking for who, what, when, where, and why. You're looking to cover the news as quickly as possible, as accurately as possible, and as objectively as possible. And, um, and that doesn't change. The only thing that's different in wartime is that you're trying to stay alive while you're doing it. Or if you're in Hawaii, you're trying to, you know, trying to get to the beach. And I'll, and I'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Kerr, for this great insights. Mm -hmm. Now we know every journalist has all the information to become the Rambo of journalism. Absolutely, you know, so. absolutely. And uh, I'm not sure now, dinner or questions? No. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure about the logistics. Questions? OK. Uh, if, if you have any question, uh, please uh, come to the front and raise your hand. Hi, my name is Rie Sakamoto. Thank you very much for a very great talk. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to ask regarding the post-PTS. Uh, so mm -hmm. what proportion, in general, what proportion of journalists do they suffer PTS? And in the initial training, do they take some precautionary measure against the journalists getting PTS, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. so, okay. um, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to it, to be honest. Uh, you don't, uh, most journalists don't get any PTSD training ahead of time. You know, it's probably we should, um, uh, because it can be a very, very uh, difficult, difficult thing to do. I covered the military pretty regularly from 1990 to about 97 or 98, and then I made a decision to stop doing it, partly because it was just too, it was just too dangerous. You know, no matter how, how well you're prepared um, and how careful or experienced you are, you know, getting hurt really oftentimes just is a matter of luck. You know, if you're on one side of a blast wall and, and a mortar comes down, you're fine. If you're on the other side and it comes down, you know, you're, you're going to get hurt. And it can be very, very, you know, difficult um, emotionally. Um, so I would say there's probably uh, a fair amount of guys. Um, uh, maybe, I don't know. Just depends on how much time you spend there. There was a, um, there was a study that was done in World War II uh, of American uh, infantry troops. And they found that the average, uh, the average U.S. Uh, soldier, infantryman, was good for about 100 days of combat. And after that, they were, you know, if they, if they hadn't been uh, injured physically, emotionally, psychologically, they were just, they were no longer effective. They just couldn't. And it was, uh, it was, 100, it was about 100 days. Now, it was either, a, it could be 100 days straight, you know, like 
three, three something, three months and a few days straight, or it could be 100 days over a two or three year period. But it was somewhere around that, that you were just, you know, no longer any good. And I think the same thing applies for journalists. I don't know what the, what the number is, but um, it's out there. So I made a decision in the late 90s that I was just gonna have, I'd had enough, and so I took a few years off and um, didn't go back until it, I did a short stint in uh, Albania for the Kosovo War, and then went back for Afghanistan and in Iraq. But it partly it was because I was a little bit worried that I was gonna get a little sketchy. Um, but uh, if you have enough time off between assignments, then you, in most cases you're fine. Um, I've always said, and I've heard and a lot of my more experienced uh, colleagues will say the same thing, is that covering wars is an assignment. It's not a career. It's, you know, this, this idea that a lot of young journalists have that, oh, I want to be a war correspondent, I want to go off and do, you know, no, you don't do that, you don't do that your whole life. You do, do that for a short period of time. And also the best rule of thumb I've always heard is, is two, two to one or three to one. If you spend, for every, every day that you spend, um, overseas or in a combat zone, you spend at least two to three at home in a normal, sane environment. And that sounds fairly reasonable to me as well. You go overseas, you spend two months or three months in, in uh, Iraq or Afghanistan, you should come home, you should be home for four or six. And get, you know, get your life back, get back on an even keel, know what normality is, and then go back again. Think. Good, okay, next please. Thank you. Okay, while they think about next question, let me sure, sure, ask a question. Uh, you know, which do you think the most friendly military in the world to our journalists? We here in Japan, we, we get a lot of attention, good attention from the American military and Japanese military. Mm -hmm. But if you are in Russia or in China or other countries in the world, do you, do you have some information or experience? What kind of, you know, friend, friendly attitude to our journalists in, in that area, basically? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, the French have the best food, so... <laughs> So always go for the French. The British have the worst, so avoid those guys. <laughs> the Americans have the second worst. Um, actually, the, the, it's a good question. The, the um, friendliest, uh, I don't want to say friendliest, but the military force that allows journalists to, the opportunity to, to do their jobs, um, more than anybody, the Marines. U.S. Marines have, are always uh, the most cooperative with reporters. And that's, you know, and that's historically been the case. A lot of people argue that's because the Marines always think that, every, that all the other services are out to steal their budget. You know, everybody, the U.S. Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, they always want to get rid of the Marines because, ah, you know, I'm Marines, you know, and so the Marines are always, have from the very beginning, you know, they're, they're, they're the smallest force, right? There's only, there's only about 170,000 of them, and, you know, the Army has like 600,000, you know, something like that. And so, um, so the Marines have always felt like, you know, they need to, to communicate with the public, they need to communicate with Congress, tell, every, tell their story, so they get the reporters out there. There's an old joke from uh, the Vietnam War, was that, um, uh, what is a Marine Corps uh, rifle squad? Uh, 12 Marines and a TV camera crew. Yeah. And it's kind of tr the same way. I mean, basically, w if I'm ever uh, in a situation covering ground combat, usually the first place you go are Marines. Usually they're, they're, usually they're the first there. That's part of the job of the Marine Corps is to, is to respond first. So they're there first, um, but also they're the friendliest. They're the easiest to cover. You go to the Marines and you know you go through you know go th go to the headquarters, find the public affairs guys, and you know, they'll they'll send you out with a troop. As long as you have your gear, as long as you have your training, as long as you know what you're doing, they send you out there and you stay with them as long as you want. A couple days, a couple weeks, a couple months. Um, you know, and the the Iraq invasion. We were assigned to a Marine unit for about uh, two months. And, you know, we just, I'm still, I'm okay, I'm all right, you know, I'm okay. The PTSD from that. So the Marines are always the, fr the friendliest. Um, uh, other forces? I don't know, usually, Usually most, fo most folks, once you're out there, are usually pretty friendly to, to journalists. You know, the, they'll usually let, let you do your job. Not all of them, but most of them are. The ones you want to stay away from are the, the militias, you know, the, the local, local troops. Anybody who's fighting on their home, in their home ground, you want to stay away from them. ISIS, you know, ISIS obviously, but even, even in Iraq uh, right now, um, yeah, I wouldn't want to be around any of the... Uh, the so-called good guy militias. Same thing. Same thing in Afghanistan. You know, you're you're just really asking for trouble if you're dealing with local forces. You, 
You know, just it's just too sketchy. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, good evening. My name is Natalie Stuckey. I'm a freelance. I have two questions. Uh, First is, what is, from your experience, uh, what do you think happened at, uh, in Baghdad at the Hotel Palestine? Some war reporters uh, who were there, they say that the, the US military shot on this hotel that was um, uh, scheduled for journalists to get the journalists away. So what is your experience? What is your point of view? And in Cairo at the Tahrir Square, uh, what do you think happened? What, what, what went wrong with the Laura Logan, the war reporter from um, CBS, what happened to her? What what, what went wrong, uh, according to your experience? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, those are two tough questions. Okay, um, the Palestine Hotel, I know what you're talking about. This was, I think, it was during the, um, the uh, uh, invasion of Iraq in 2002. The American troops had arrived in Baghdad, right? And you had a bunch of, you had reporters were staying at the at this hotel. The, the Iraqi government basically put them all in one place, right? Okay, and uh, a reporter, cameraman was shot on a balcony, right? He was shot on a balcony. And the question was, so the question is, who, who shot him and, and why and how did that happen? Um, obviously, I wasn't there. I was with the troops who were coming into the city. I was with the Marines who were coming into the city. Um, as far as uh, anybody targeting that building, knowing that there were journalists in there, I, just, I don't buy that at all. It's just an accident. Um, Almost certainly, the, uh, the, it was a cameraman, I think, cameraman or a photographer was out on the balcony and aiming a long lens down at, at the troops who were coming in. And, you know, you have to remember, when well, these troops are coming into town, they, they really, they only have rough maps. They don't know what every building is and where everybody is. They don't know who's in there. They don't know where the bad guys are. They're tired, they're cold, they're hungry, they're scared. And they're expecting people to shoot at them. So they see anything. So you look up and you see somebody on a balcony with pointing a black thing at you. The first thing they're going to do is shoot at you. So I would not be at all surprised if it was Americans who shot the guy. It might have been somebody else, but it probably was Americans who shot him uh, accidentally. And I can tell you, they probably would feel horrible if they knew if they if they knew that they'd shot you know a journalist. Um, but you just at that. You know, under those circumstances, I mean, those things happen all the time. Friendly fire incidents, you know, happen all the time. Friendly fires when one, one unit, you know, you shoot, you know, shoot your own, you know, shoot your own guys. Those things happen all the time in, in wartime. Not all the time, but very, very frequently. And I'm surprised they don't happen all the time in ground combat. It's just, it's chaotic. You know, ground, any kind of ground combat action is absolutely chaotic. And, um, you know, once the shooting starts, you know, you, you know, it's, uh, people are going to get hurt. So in that particular case, no, I don't think, I'm sure nobody deliberately targeted it because there's journalists in there. Um, but you know, that doesn't make a difference to the, the guy who got shot. Basically, rule of thumb, again, something they always teach you in the, in the hostile environment training is if you see any troops coming towards you, do not act in any way that could be construed as, as threatening. Don't point a camera at anybody. Make sure they see your hands, and then you have a chance of not getting shot. But especially going out on a balcony in a high building with armored vehicles coming down the street, uh, it's just too bad. Tahrir Square, boy, uh, again, I wasn't there. Uh, I used to work for CBS News, so I know Lara Logan well. well. Um, and it was terrible what happened with her. Um, but it was a mob, you know? Mobs are, as I said earlier, mobs scare me more than anything else in the, in the world. Um, I mean, it was never really, didn't get too scared in, um, in firefights, you know, with one, one military force fight shooting in another. I never got too scared at that. But it was mobs always scared me because you can't control them and you can't reason with a mob. And, no, and when people get together in mobs, they do things that they would never individually do. So in this case, you know, you had a, Tahrir Square was just full of angry young men and they were, there was no authority controlling them. And, you know, Middle East countries have a reputation, fair enough or not, for being sort of misogynistic. And here's a foreign lady. Why not? You know, so, you know, it's a place that she probably should not have gone. You know, I know she had some guards with her. Um, but, you know, guards really can't, can't help you in a, in a mob situation like that.
but she, you know, evidently she felt it was it was a risk worth taking, and she's still working now, and so I'm sure she's. She'd probably tell you it would it was the, you know, if not the right thing to do, it was at least, at least it was a reasonable decision. Uh, I would. My general rule of thumb is you don't go anywhere near a mob, particularly if you're female. I mean, maybe it does. I hope that doesn't sound sexist or misogynistic or anything, but just women are even more of a target than than um, than men. So yeah. You see a mob, just don't go anywhere. You go head in, head in the other direction. That would be my advice. Yeah. Question? Could you tell us a bit about the technology? I think probably people can hear me. But we, we need it for the record. Oh, you, you must report. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, your name and Sorry. Yeah, So I'm uh, Dominic Kyo and I'm with Rico. Uh, so it may be a little self-serving, but you talked about the role of technology uh, for mm -hmm. your trade. Mm -hmm. And obviously technology mm -hmm. is moving incredibly fast. So I was kind of curious as to hey, how you say, stay yourself up to speed with technology. How do you make sure you're going traveling with the right kit? Because as you said, it, 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 there's a lot of different sort of moving parts in terms of how you're trying to communicate on a global scale, selling big files, sound files, video files, and so on. And how do you train yourself up? You're on the move, and, you, and you've got to figure out how to use all this junk. You know? mm -hmm. so how do you actually add all of that together and keep yourself to make sure that you've got the right stuff? OK. Um, first of all, you start with the money. You start with a budget that you have available. If you know, you know how much, whatever money that you have or, or your organization has, and you ask if you could basically spend it. You start with what the kit that you have. Now, the stuff that I was using uh, almost 10 years ago now, almost, it's kind of out of date. So I wouldn't be using most of that. Um, I'd have to replace a lot of that. But I have some camera equipment of my own now, um, and I would use that instead. Um, but it depends where you're going, what you're going to do, um, and, and what your assignment is going to be. If you're, um, if, you're go if you're a part of a bigger crew, you're going to have more sophisticated equipment. Um, and if you're a smaller crew or a one-man band is what we call a one person, which is what I used to do a lot, um, you're going to get uh, the smallest, lightest equipment you, you, that you can get, and you're going to sacrifice quality for, for portability. Um, and you're also going to, um, uh, you're going to, you're going to um, sacrifice the ability to go live, again, for portability. Now, a lot of that's changed. You can be, you can, uh, Ten years ago, you didn't go live as a one-man band. Now you're kind of really pretty much expected to. The equipment is going to be small enough, but still, it still is going to be fairly. If you want to be to to go live, you're going to have a fair amount of equipment to drag around. So that's really going to um, um, it's going to determine what you do. In um, uh, in the Battle of Fallujah in I think 2004 in in Iraq, um, I was assigned to an American Special Forces unit that was with some Iraqi sort of commando guys, and they were going in on the first night. And the first night of the battle, they were going to go into an area and grab a hospital and a section in a section of the, I think it was Euphrates River on the western part of Fallujah. And I was going to cover that. And the plan was that this unit was going to go in, grab it, wait a couple of hours, and then have a, a uh, regular forces, these are special forces guys, then have the regular forces come in and, and grab it. So we're going to go in and go out. Well, I had um, all my, my gear with me, and I was going to film it, and my job was to, since I was a pool reporter, was to file, it, file everything back to London as quickly as possible. So I had a fairly, I had two fairly big cases full of equipment, because live filing back then, even when you're using BGANs and stuff, it took a fair amount of equipment. Well. The Army guys who were in charge didn't want me taking all that equipment. They said, well, look, we don't have much room. We have these big, we have these trucks, lots and lots of guys. We can't, you know, you, you, just take your camera and um, just take your camera. And when we get back to the base, uh, you can file from there. And I started arguing. I said, no, 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 wait a minute. We don't know, you don't know how long we're going to be there. The plan is to be there for two hours and come back. That would be fine, but you could get stuck. We don't know. And uh, back and forth, we argued and argued and argued. And finally, they said, we compromised, and they said, okay, you can take one case of stuff with you, um, but that's all. So in that case, so I took all my, my uh, f video stuff and editing stuff and transmission stuff, but not the live TV stuff. And um, I'm glad I did. Well, it would have been nice to have the, the, the live TV, but I made that compromise. And it was, um, as it turned out, we were there for about 24 hours. 
We went in, we, they, the guys that went in, they grabbed the hospital, they grabbed these two bridges. It was a very dramatic thing. And um, I was able to uh, do a quick edit and file the stuff back from the hospital from, the, from the, 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 the hospital parking lot was covered with broken glass and rain was coming down and heavy wind. I was filing stuff back. But they made the decision, okay, we're gonna stay here till dawn. We're not gonna go back to dangerous. Okay, so if I hadn't had my gear with me, if I had just left it all behind, I wouldn't have gotten that done, okay? Now, dawn comes along and fighting starts. Basically, the guys just the, the bad guys just across the river saw saw all the Rockies and the commando stuff. So they start shooting. So this huge firefight, and this huge day long battle starts right across the river, bridges and stuff. And so we stayed for that. The guys I was with, this oh you know they didn't want to leave. You know they wanted to fight. Right? It's like it's like a football game or something like that. You know it was like so. And I vi got video of that, and I spent all day you know um, uh, transmitting. Uh, you know, just short clips back, because it didn't have a lot of bandwidth, so you can only, you know, there's a certain amount that you just can't do. But I was able to get stuff back all day long, and so that worked out. But still, you know, I wasn't able to, to go live, and it would have been perfect. I mean, because basically this was the major fighting of the day. I mean, this was the major thing that was going on. It was, it was quite dramatic, and it would have been a really, really great story. It would have been fun to go live and all that. Couldn't do it because of the equipment stuff. Um, so it all really depends on the, on the, the specifics. As far as staying up to date, uh, today, <laughs> I gave a call to my friends at CBS and said, what's the latest you're using? And so he tells me all this Jero stuff, which I had never heard about until today. But anyway, um, that's kind of the standard that's now. And in six months from now, there'll be something new. So basically just, you know, you stay up late on the, you know, stay up late studying. Yeah. So, okay. Just to follow up on uh, your mm. question, mm. how about drones now for reporters and the uh, field zone? Mm. Do you mm. think it's, it's possible? Uh, I, I know they're, they're doing it. I don't, um, in a military environment, they won't let you take them. They won't let you take them because it's just you know, too dangerous, too risky, you know, and they can't control the, they can't control the, um, you know, um, can, can't really control, um, you know, what you're doing with it. Right, and, and it's gonna, it could very easily expose your unit, you know, if you take it up and send it over that hill. Now, the, the, the military use them all the time, of course, but it's theirs, you know, they, they're controlling it, so they, they know where they're gonna send it. Because if there's some bad guys over on the other side of the hill and you send a drone up there, they're gonna know that, you know, the Americans or somebody's around all the time. So, um, the military will never let you um, use a drone in, in a real, combat sort of uh, um, environment. But for rear areas and for, you know, really artistic stuff, you know, you want like really artsy shots of sunsets and troops moving in, in the rear area, I'm sure they're using that. So, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Any more questions? Yeah. Please. Sure, you have a question. <laughs> All right, uh, let me... Natalie, Natalie's got a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, in, the, in the, the kits you have to bring, you said you need uh, cotton cloths, uh, waterproof um, bags, and so on. What, did you say a cigarette lighter? <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> cigarette lighter. Why do you need a cigarette lighter? You know, you always got, you know, you always got to start fires, believe uh, it or not. You mean, you know, there's just a lot of basic stuff. I, mean, I know it's, you know, I don't smoke and stuff, but, but um, you, you, it seems like you always need a lighter for some reason, you know. You know, if, if you run out of, if you, you know, if you lose your flashlights, you know, you got candles around or something like that, or um, if you've got a Coleman stove, you know, if you're in a cold place, you know, like a, a kerosene stove, you need to light that. Um, uh, when we were with, when we were embedded with the Marines for the last, uh, for the invasion of Iraq, we actually, we had a Humvee. We, we bought a, a civilian Humvee. We, you know, believe it or not, we shipped it over to Iraq to, yeah, anyway. But one of our guys on our team loved Turkish coffee. He just loved Turkish coffee. So he brought along this case full of coffee and a, and a, you know, a coffee maker, and basically he used, uh, you know, a, a Coleman stove for that, so. Yeah, we wouldn't have any coffee, no hot coffee without the lighter, so yeah. Always have a lighter. You know, you need lighters, you need 
duct tape, you need bungee cords. Bungee cords are the greatest things in the world, you know. Because you, you use them for like, like um, you know, lashing stuff to your gear. But also, you know what you, one of the most useful things for? It's like a, it's like a, you know, a laundry line or still hanging your, your, your stuff up. If you have a tent, you know, if you're, you're in a tent or you're in some, like, some crum, crummy place when you're, you're sleeping on the floor or a cot, you don't want all your gear, you know, your clothes on the floor. So you just take the bungee cord and you, you know, strip it from one to the other and you put all your clothes and stuff on top of that. And, you know, it's, and bungee cords are great. Bungee cords and duct tape. World peace, I'm telling you. Thanks. Okay, let me... Please. participate in the mm -hmm. questions. I'm not trying to take advantage of mm -hmm. being the moderator. You know, now I want tomorrow to go with you to the Senkaku Islands and mm -hmm. to the Northern Islands mm -hmm. to report about it. Mm -hmm. And we risk the being arrested. Mm -hmm. But how can we do that without being arrested and with avoiding uh, the uh, coast guards and avoiding like uh, pirates or anybody else? Because you know, I'm, I'm doing TV, same as you did. And we need our own footage of mm. these islands. I don't want to go to NHK and they sell me one minute per mm. 160,000 yen. So mm. I'd rather film it myself. Mm. So what shall we do in order to have a successful trip, reporting trip, to disputed islands? Well, there's Thank no you. shooting there now, so I'm useless. You know, I no idea. In that case, the Senkakus would be an interesting thing. Um, you could probably get out there. There's, you'd have to go down to Miyako, Miyakojima. One of the nearest islands, it's not the, Miyakojima, yeah. That's where the, the administrative control is there, right? So you go down there and you'd rent, rent a fishing boat. Now the problem is it can take a full day. It could take a full day to get out there. And the, the, the time. you have the time, okay. And it's, um, you know, it's really rough water, small boat, rough water. You're gonna, you gonna, you gonna get seasick or, okay. You think you can handle that? Okay. And, uh, you know, the smartest thing would probably be to coordinate with the Coast Guard. I mean, you know, you don't want to mess with law enforcement or armed forces unless you really have to. You know, it's usually it's better to coordinate ahead of time because, you know, accidents can happen. And, you know, if, if people have guns, even, even the Coast Guard, you know, those are armed guys, probably not going to hurt you. But you can't, you know, you could get hurt, um, especially if you just happen to be out there during that one, t you know, you know, two or three times a month, the, the Chinese, war mm. Chinese ships go sailing through there. So if it's just bad luck, you arrive at the same time, something bad could happen. So, um, you know, I'm sorry, I don't think I would go out to the Senkaku Islands without coordinating with, with, the, coast, with the Japanese Coast Guard first. And probably they tell you you can't go. You can't That's go. Fine. You can't go. Um, you could get, uh, you know, rent an aircraft or, or rent an airplane. I don't know. Probably, if you really wanted your own footage of the Senkaku Islands, the the, the best bet might be to uh, talk to the U.S. Navy, which flies air patrols over there. They have the P3 planes. They would fly. You know, they could. You know, they're they're flying out in the East China Sea all the time. So get out on one of those aircraft and ask if the if you you know if if you can get some pictures of Senkaku Islands. You know that that might work. But otherwise, I don't believe in taking chances or screwing around unless you really, unless there's a, a really good reason to do it. You know, just you know, safety, safety, safety. Even in a situation like the Senkakus, where nobody's shooting right now, you, know, you don't take any chances because things are always, you know, bad things are waiting out there to happen. Bad things that you can't control are always waiting to happen. So you have to control those things that you can. That's my that's my view. Well, basically, you, you call it, you know, you, you, know, you, you treat the, the Coast Guard like a gateway organization. You call their headquarters, public affairs, and talk to them, to, you know, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to do. And they say, oh, well, no, you can't. And then you say, well, yeah, I know we can't, but, you know, if we could, how would we do it? And they say, no, and you call them, and you call them, and you, they won't let, let you do it today, but you call them the next day, and then you call them the next day, and you call them the next day, and you call them the next day, until finally you wear them down. I mean, as you know, that's, that's the whole 
the whole secret of journalism is just to keep beating people on the head until they finally say, oh, okay, okay, give up, right? You just don't take it no for an answer. And I think eventually you would. Now, it might take six months, you know? Can you wait six months? Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. So, so we can wait. So, so good, no problem. Yeah. Okay, I think we are about to move to dinner. Thank you very much, Kirk, for your great insights and lessons. We really will be uh, using some of this stuff here. Good. Good. Especially when I cover the Oyoku here, I might need some stuff good. here. Good. I'll sell you some. Yeah. Okay. And now we would like to move to the uh, dinner table, and during which we can also you know, talk together and you can ask any question. And before we go, please give Kirk a big hand. Thank you very much. Thank you.